Welcome to the Your Local Studio Podcast, the resource for business leaders and entrepreneurs providing advice on marketing, lead generation, and online video. Hi, I'm Alex with Your Local Studio, and today I have Matt Riley with Royal Oaks Homes. He's the marketing director over there. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Excited to jump into our today's topic around authenticity, how to stay authentic in this digital world that we're in. Recently, I interviewed two brilliant individuals with SNA Communications, uh, Chuck Norman, who leads SNA, and David Morrison, their digital strategy analyst. And we're going to show four clips from that interview, and then we're going to come back and hear Matt's thoughts on those as as one who actually puts these ideas into action and get his his, his feedback and, and ideas on that. So we're going to just jump right into the first clip uh, from the interview with the starting question of what does authenticity in business mean and why is it so important? Here we go. What does authenticity in business mean to you and why is it important? So well, Chuck, why don't you start with that? Sure. You know, I think um, every entrepreneur goes into business, you know, over-enthused and undercapitalized, and they all think they have a great product and service. Everybody has a widget, and they think it's the best. And if it's not the best, it's at least comparable to other widgets. Um, but what do you do to separate yourself from all those equal offerings? And that's what I think authenticity is and what it means and how important it is. How do you separate yourself? How do you carry yourself as a business? Because again, when you're comparing apples to apples, what sets you apart? Are you a good community leader? Um, you know, do you do things over and above what your service offerings are? Um, you know, how do you have your brand represent your company in the community? Um, do your people get out there and represent your brand well? Um, are they genuine people? You know, you, you see a lot of sales pitches and you see a lot of folks come in with these big flashy presentations, but at the end of the day, is it any better than the person that came in and didn't charge you $20,000 for that pitch? Um, so th that's what I kind of see as authenticity in the marketplace. How, how are you as a reputable person? Because again, at the end of the day, we want to work with people. The brand is the brand, but we want to work with people that are authentic and that are looking out for our best interests. How does then creating authenticity online factor into the trust factor? Yeah, you know, just to take a step back, you know, you can't do PR and marketing without digital anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, agencies that or, or companies that have a PR and marketing function, if they don't have a very solid digital footprint, they're going to fall behind. Um, you don't just send a press release to a reporter anymore or to uh, any type of medium. You actually have to develop a relationship and talk with those folks. And again, we go back to the authenticity, create real relationships because there's a shrinking newsroom where people are trying to get placed and published, but you have much fewer print pages, but you have an unlimited number of digital pages out there. Mm -hmm. So once you get to know the reporter uh, for a particular medium, then you got to get in touch with all the bloggers and everybody else that are associated with that industry, that vertical, even that publication, because everybody's talking about you whether you're hearing it or not. If we're looking at examples of poor ways to be authentic online, what would that look like? I, I think a lot of folks think that um, you have to have a, a social media presence, um, regardless of um, what the content is, or you have to have the most number of followers or eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if I have 10,000 followers and two people are engaged, does that matter? You know, so it, it doesn't. You know, I, I've been consulting with clients for years about, oh, we've got to have a social media presence. And I go back and ask why? You know, just because the Joneses across the street are doing it? Uh, and that's the, not the right reason to do it. If you don't have a real message and a real developed list of eyeballs that you're going to be communicating those messages to, there's no reason to do it. I think B2, B2B, is much more important for a social media presence than B2C, depending on the size of your brand. Um, you know, there are a lot of things you can do to engage an audience whenever it's a consumer rather than, you know, B2B type activity. And so I try to steer people away from doing things other people are doing just because they're doing them. There has to be a real reason behind it. I think that's a desire of a lot of people to say, well, okay, every, everyone's using all these different social media tools, so I must be on Twitter, I must be on Facebook, I have to be on LinkedIn. But maybe that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's industry specific. I mean, it, it may not apply for a B2B business to be on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that was a great answer, Chuck. That hit the nail on the head right there. So when uh, a company or somebody's running a company is looking at then being on a certain platform or being able to communicate through a, a specific medium, what do they have to watch out for uh, that could damage their authenticity when people are saying, okay, I don't know if I can trust these people anymore. What, what are the things that they should watch out for? I think David's going to have a much better answer to this um, from a technical standpoint, but 
I think you have to look at the medium and what that medium addresses. You know, you see LinkedIn, I'm just going to use some of the most popular, but LinkedIn is very catered towards business. Facebook is very catered towards personal life. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of folks that try to force business on people through Facebook. Um, and that's not the best way to do it. You know, LinkedIn can also just be a place to recruit. Um, so you have to figure out what parts of each medium that you're going to be using and for what purpose. Um, but. Yeah, I, just a few things to add to that um, in terms of specifics that a company would want to watch out for would be always maintain a positive presence on the web. Hmm. Put your best foot forward. Dive into that. What does that mean then, then, then positive presence? How can somebody be positive in their presence online? Um, portraying a positive message. Uh, don't speak negatively of your competitors. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. don't s don't sound like Debbie Downer. <laughs> like if, if it's raining outside, spin it so that it's positive mm -hmm. versus oh it's a it's a bad day no oh, it's a fantastic day my crops are going to are, are going to grow taller you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. i'll take that a step further and you know online reviews are also social media you know you look at the yelps of the world mm -hmm. a lot of business owners take personal offense when someone says something negative about themselves mm -hmm. and they'll come to us and say we need to do some reputation management right away and i'm going you know positive and negative re reviews are very important to viewers. 93% mm -hmm. of everybody online looking for anything, um, while well, they go online to look for whether or not you're reputable, whether or not you have good service. Mm -hmm. And I personally, uh, and I think a lot of people that I communicate with, throw out the best reviews and the worst reviews. Mm -hmm. I mean, because quite honestly, how could you have the most wonderful experience of your life getting an <laughs> oil change? True. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's it, an oil change. It's an oil change. Um, so, you know, you take those middle of the road um, mm -hmm. reviews, and I think that's what you really look at. I mean, I think we all do that kind of research now, whether we're buying a television or a car. Just 10 years ago, people would do research for about an hour looking for a dealership to go to. Um, and they would pick three dealerships to go to after they had gone through 25 dealerships. Now they spend 20 minutes and they go to one dealership one dealership. They don't even go to three to see what's the best because they can do all the research online now. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how things have changed. But back to the reviews, we tell customers, you need those negative reviews. They may be past employees, they may be, you know, whatever the case may be. But whenever you start trying to put out a defense against some of those things, it makes mm. you look poor. So that was really uh, interesting how they kind of broke that down. Let's, let's hear your thoughts. What does authenticity mean to you then? Well, for me, Alex, authenticity is, is it real? You know, mm. you think of, you know, you, you buy something and you get a certificate, certificate of authenticity for it, and it's, it certifies that it's actually real. And so for, for me and my business, my business, um, authenticity is, does the public perceive me or my brand the way that I think that they should or the way that I would like them to? Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. What about social media, the, the, the thoughts on you should only be on certain social media profiles or mediums uh, to be authentic in that? Well, you know, I, I think that the social media is another way for a company slash brand to be authentic to the consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, they made some they made some good points that some things are industry specific. You know, if you're a B2B you know, business, mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe your focus is on LinkedIn because that seems to be the more business related type of the of the social media Only platforms. Business. Hopefully no cats on LinkedIn. That's right. That's right. No, you don't see any cat videos on LinkedIn. Yes. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that there's not other people behind there. Mm -hmm. So I think that you do have to be actively engaged in all of the different platforms, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a way, you know, people want to have a connection to a brand or to a company somehow. And social media allows the consumer to kind of see the behind the curtains part and not just the, you know, the very uh, uh, front part of your website. Your website's the starting point, and that's where your all the professionalism goes, and, you know, everybody is on their best behavior. You know, it's that first date type mentality. Ah. Everybody's on their best behavior, but social media really gets to, the people get to see the, the people behind the company. Mm -hmm. And what that means is I don't think you should be just on one platform, even though you're you're mainly focused on B2B, because there are people in that company that like to consume media and information in different ways. Mm -hmm. And personally, they may not be on LinkedIn. They may be on they may be all over Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is. And you might be able to connect with that audience in a different way other than just your company's, you know, 
connecting on, on just on the, 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 main, the main platforms that you think might be the best. Before you had mentioned about this, uh, before we started this, this interview, we were talking about that example of that uh, agency who yeah. decided to target a different uh, platform than they would have. Tell me more about that again. So, you know, the example is, you know, you think that the, the person that you're targeting or the company that you're targeting, if you're an ad agency, we use the word targeting, but, um, you know, that, that person may not be the social media um, guru or even the person that you may think is even on social media at all. It may not meet that... Um, the, the, the profile of what you think you're, you're trying to get to, but through different forms of social media, you might be able to get to that person indirectly through their circle. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can create ad content or content as a whole um, that may trigger someone in that person's circle to go show it to them. Like their kids. Like it could be their kids, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe dad's the CEO of Pepsi and may not be on Facebook. But yet you might want to create something that's going to get that guy's attention through Facebook. But, you know, you can target something that's going to that that maybe um, will generate a response from their kids or Mm -hmm. a family member or someone that they're really close with that is on there and will show them like, oh, hey, Bob, you should check. Did you see this? And, And then, boom, you've got a you've got a big deal. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's jump back back into the second clip, uh, and then we'll come back and chat about it. Here we go. People talked about content marketing. Uh, is, you know, this, this is a buzzword right now, mm-hmm. but would you say it's kind of been around maybe for for a long time? Just now, we're transitioning to in a digital sense. <laughs> it just has a name now because us PR people gave it one. <laughs> Very um, nice. It's been there ever since the internet's been there. People just didn't realize it or they didn't mm-hmm. label it. Mm-hmm. And so um, now we just have to be aware of it and use the buzzword why it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's going to change. I mean, something else is going to take its place, but content's never going away. It's just how it's delivered that's changing. Um, mm-hmm. Content has been delivered since you know the printed word has been out there. And how did you get it to those, in, those eyeballs that made a difference to your brand? And you know, before it might have been a stone tablet, and now it's 16 different devices. Now it's just a tablet. <laughs> it is, <yeah. laughs> it's a tablet. <laughs> so uh, you know, you have to be careful about how you change your messaging for those different mediums. Mm-hmm. Um, people receive things in a different way, and they appreciate them, and 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 I think understand your message differently based on how they get it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a magazine is something that just sits around your house, and you can go back to it as many times as you want. And some people say it has a more more of a shelf life than digital content. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true to a certain extent because people will pass that along to other folks. Your news feed, your email inbox, all these other mediums that you're getting digital data into it goes away very quickly. Mm -hmm. The next thing replaces it very quickly. And so I think you have to be a little more creative in those digital mediums on what you're saying and how quickly you're saying it to make an impact. And sometimes you have to say it many more times to make an impact. Already starting right from the beginning steps, how do I be authentic to the end uh, consumer that I want to reach? Let's dive into that a bit more. Well, I mean, again, that's a moving target and very subjective based on industry vertical. Uh, But you really do have to do a little bit of your marketing research in advance. I mean, you do have to understand the space itself, in my opinion, before you go out there and offer a similar gadget than somebody else or service that is offering. So uh, I think you really have to understand, you know, what your motivation is as a business owner. Yes, you have a great product, but what are you trying to achieve? Is it just money? I mean, there's a lot of people in business just for money. There are a lot of people that are in business to make an impact in the world or their families' lives. And so I think you have to take that into consideration for your brand and your messaging with your brand. So um, it it really goes back to, do I want to work with this company because the product is great, or do I want to work with these individuals because they're good people? Mm -hmm. With social media, you would say it's definitely uh, creating an open ecosystem to see the people inside of a company Mm -hmm. um, where there has been issues in past of where employees of a company will mess up on social media and that can come back and damage <laughs> yeah, yeah. the company. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we, I mean, we create social media policies all the time, so people should follow the rules, but they don't <laughs> anyway. I, mean, I think people, when they clock out at the end of the day, um, do people even still use that word? Uh, yeah. When people leave the business, they're still a representative of that brand. I mean, people leave with logoed shirts and other things, and they may be at the store and somebody upsets them, and they say something, and 16 people are, have a camera on their phone, you know, filming this event. And it may have died quickly, but it may live on forever. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be very careful about that. I mean, you just never know who's watching and who's listening. So you always have to represent your
your brand at the highest level and assume that if you're not a business owner, but you're an executive with the company that has a presence on the outside, mm -hmm. that you're very careful with your brand because everybody, somebody's watching all the time and everybody can, can be watching within seconds if they choose to upset the brand in any way. Most basic uh, tool that I would recommend to any company, if they haven't already done so, they should at least be taking advantage of Google Analytics. Okay. Uh, to track their uh, their website and um, there's all kinds of uh, useful features to that that Google is constantly coming out with new features that make it even more valuable to site owners. You can uh, see behavior flow, exactly how people are interacting with your site from point A to point B. Are they filling out the form? Are they going to this page? Where are they dropping off at? Where are they losing interest? All of that suddenly becomes visible. So, mm -hmm. Which is all very important to the PR and marketing side because we think we understand everything about a potential audience. Mm -hmm. And we realize every day that that audience is evolving every day. So that's why digital is so important because traditional print, you may be out there for a month or two months or something that may only publishes you know, six times a year longer. Um, but digital, you can change your messaging every single day to cater to these changes in the marketplace. And let's, let's, let's call it something like a heat map. You can see where things, um, information is being, you know, um, received well and creating the type of action that you want it to create. And you can see whenever it's, it's not doing well. So you can stop what's not doing well, ramp up what's doing well, and then start to create additional opportunities to marry into the things that are doing well. So fascinating content. Now, this this concept of content marketing, let's break that down a little bit. What are your thoughts? Well, I think the word content marketing is one of the new buzzwords. It's kind of mm -hmm. like SEO or PPC or, you know, all these different types of think terms that people throw around. And just It's just the new buzzword, content marketing. Personally, I, I think it should be called context marketing. Hmm. What you put out there should actually matter. Just because you have content doesn't mean it actually has any meat to it. It doesn't mean that it actually connects to your audience. Mm -hmm. You could be putting out all kinds of content that's completely irrelevant. Yeah, so true. Let, let's talk about how are you getting your content out there right now in an authentic way. Sure. I mean, one of the ways that we try to get out there is you know, through our social media platforms. Like I said before, that's one of the ways that the consumer can kind of see behind the curtain. They can see that there's a company, there's there's people behind that company, and they're real. Um, and that lets people know that they're authentic. They actually say, or their actions do what they say that they're going to do. Um, and, and so... And also, I think another way to get your stuff out there authentically is through community events and community service and the company being involved in that in the, surround, in the surrounding community that they're in. What are you guys doing right now that, as an example for that? Well, one of the things that we, we're doing right now, we, we partner with a, a nonprofit organization that's called Operation Coming Home. Hmm. Um, and this is the sixth time that we've done it. Um, and it's a really amazing cause. One of the, what we do there is we actually uh, will build a house for um, – and an injured vet from Iraq or Afghanistan that had been severely injured. And um, we partner with our subcontractors and the land partners, and we get everybody together. And what we're able to do is build build this well-deserved person and their family a home and give it to them for free. For free. For free. So I think that's one of the ways that we get out there, um, and I think that's authentic to us. We, mm -hmm. you don't, we don't we – don't, really go out there and brag about it. You won't see a lot about it out mm -hmm. there um, because we don't try to use that as a way to market ourselves, but it's just a way that we're involved in the community and trying to say that we care. We're not just, you know, this massive company out of California somewhere. Mm -hmm. We actually live here we and we work here and we're part of the community. And that's just ways that we want to be authentic in the Raleigh market. And I think though, without you trying to blast it on social media that we're so authentic, we're so authentic, right. and look at what we're doing. I think indirectly, though, ideally, if you do it right, other people will be putting that on social media. Absolutely. And so then this uh, aligning both the offline, what you do in the community, to what happens online, Yeah. if you have the right mindset, basically. Yeah, and, and we you, we put it out there for the right reasons. You, you will go to our, our social media platforms and see that we're talking about it, but it's, it's to wait, raise awareness about the cause, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. the, about Operation Coming Home. And we actually have people that come to us and buy from us because they saw, and they'll actually say, I saw that you you guys did this and I want to I want to do business with a company that cares. Wow. That's powerful. Cool. Well, let's jump into the next clip and then we'll come back. One thing we talk about in crisis communication is having holding messages ready for certain instances. So natural disasters, fire, um, anything that could possibly happen to create a disruption in your normal business day. Mm -hmm. 
those holding messages could go in a place what we call a dark site for a community uh, or for a, a or an organization. So that dark site could go up immediately to um, report to bloggers and uh, journalists and anybody else so they know that we're aware of the situation. You think of a few years ago back when Captain Sully landed in the Hudson, it only took 90 seconds for um, the airline or for the first post to go up with video of him landing in the Hudson. It took two and a half hours for the airline to actually get their crisis communication strategy in place. So the news had been going on for basically what seemed like forever um, because of social media. Mm -hmm. um, the airline did have a dark site ready to go, but the news had already been created. So what they had to do was go back and take that holding messaging that they had and manipulate it to fit or discredit some of the things that had been said about the situation at hand. But that holding messaging was already in place, so they didn't have to start from scratch. They were able to start about 50% through and then catch up very quickly. So over the next few hours, things were communicated appropriately. Wow, that's that, that powerful to have that already planned and, mm -hmm. and have in place. How many companies think actually have that? Uh, I would say less than 10%. A lot of the big wow. brands um, do, you know, wow. your fortune companies do, but a lot of smaller uh, folks, the small and mid-level business don't because it's expensive to have a plan like that in mm -hmm. place. It's expensive to train. It becomes part of your annual training. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that you just don't keep on a shelf, but you have to keep people up to date on latest trends and how to communicate and how information throw, uh, flows within your organization before it goes outside of your four walls. Mm -hmm. So once a year, if not more often, depending on the type of business that you have, you need to update your, your brand strategy and your crisis communication strategy because things are always changing around you and you need to make sure let's say you're a hospital you need to make sure that if you had a crisis uh, plan for the hospital you also have a crisis communication plan for the hospital uh, but people don't think of it that way until after their brands already been destroyed and it may cost them ten times that much to repair their brand but if they just would have spent you know a little bit of money in advance to be trained appropriately and keep people up to date um, they could have saved themselves tens of thousands of dollars in branding work, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and other things. For a small business starting out, and it may just seem like, wow, I don't know if I could handle pre-planning all this crisis stuff. Is there maybe one or two things they, they could start with uh, to what kind of crisis that could be? Uh, any ideas? Yeah, I mean, honestly, just sit down and do a brainstorming session with your executive leadership and talk about all the things that have happened at your current job and things that have happened in prior lives um, that could f creep into what's happened um, in, in your unique situation with the business you're with now. I mean, everybody's had experiences where their brand could have been damaged and maybe that was caught in advance and it never made it outside of those four walls. But that's less and less likely to happen now when there's so many people, again, walking around with cameras or um, photos or whatever it might be. So I would sit down with your management team and talk about even little things could be a crisis. You know, losing your keys and not being able to get to a huge meeting that you're going to close a huge deal could be a crisis, but does that make the news media? Of course not. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to think about what's going to happen potentially and be ready for those things that could affect your brand outside of those four walls. For instance, you know, let's just say you were a construction company and you're building a new neighborhood and you cut off power to the whole left side of Cary. All of a sudden that affects other people besides your brand. No kidding. So you have to have something in place right away mm -hmm. um, and communicate what's being done to remedy the situation and get things back to normal as quickly as possible. Um, digitally, that's even a bigger issue, you know, I mean, because somebody's going to be sitting there in their car and mm -hmm. they're going to be stopped at because at, they can't get across the street because, you know, the, the lights are out and they're going to be tweeting, you know, what's going on here, you know, and they're going to assume the big truck that's sitting there drilling the hole is the reason for it and it may have your brand on the side of the truck. There's a picture of it, next thing you know it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Could go viral, it could just stick into Cary because that's where it happened and everybody, you know, how much they love Cary. Um, we love our town but others don't always think as positively about the brand. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we want to make sure that we limit our pos possible negative exposure as quickly as possible. So if they would have had some holding messages or if they would have had some forethought that we do a lot of digging. You know, we had this meeting before and we do a lot of digging. We know that we could cut power or water or anything like that. They could have been ready right then to put, put out messaging to their networks and the news media before the home journalists started telling their story for them. How do you balance then uh, being that analytical side of, you know, you need to market and how you do that to also the culture, being able to, to get your culture of your unique business out there. How do you balance the two? Social media is very personal, so it's a two-way communication channel. A, a lot of businesses will use social media only to push and promote themselves when it really involves or requires um, a real person 
who represent your company. They can communicate like a person and not so formally like it's so, uh, just a business. Uh, and that, that works in certain applications and in certain industries. Some industries do require a very formal uh, uh, representative, but uh, most businesses, it, it actually is more beneficial to them to have a person who will actually respond in a timely fashion uh, to negative inquiries or even positive ones, to thank them for, uh, you know, for the kind words or for sharing their posts and things like that. I will give a personal experience. I had a bad experience on Delta Airlines once, mm -hmm. and my flight was delayed three times. I was sitting in the airport because I had nothing else to do, so I said at Delta, can't believe my flight is now three hours past its takeoff point. <laughs> Made a couple other small comments, but within two minutes, Delta had responded on Twitter and wow. asked if I could be catered to in any way. And that was enough for me to take my, I wasn't angry, but it was just my frustration level down a notch and go, okay, this brand cares about what I think about their airline and wants to make sure that anybody talking about their brand does so in a positive way, even if the situation is negative. And I think it's about reaction time as much as it is about, you know, I feel like they were authentic um, in their concern for my negative situation because of how quickly they responded. Mm -hmm. And so authenticity can be more than just, um, you know, are you different? But how quickly do you respond and does it seem genuine? So taking that, that example of then how Chuck experienced the customer service through Delta Airways, how, how, what have you experienced where maybe people come on, uh, uh, onto your social media profiles and comment on that? How do you manage that? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think that having that, that backup PR, that kind of doomsday thing already planned out, is I think that's really specific to how large your company is. Mm. You know, as, as, a, as a local small business, you know, here in Raleigh, you know, we don't necessarily have a, a dark site lined up, you know, ready to go in case of emergency because, you know, we build homes. What, there's, there's not that kind of emergencies going on. But we do, you know, we do see things. We do have interactions. I mean, we're people. You know, we build homes with natural products and human hands, and there's weather involved. So things are going to happen, and it's just a matter of how you take care of it. You know, so we have people that engage us through social media. And, you know, I think an example of that would be, you know, you've got a couple options as a company. So someone engages you on your website, positive or negative. Um, of course, positive, you want to leave it up there, right? But most people m may want to lean towards, well, someone just goes on there and complains on your social media site. Mm -hmm. did you, you, can, you can just delete it. As the administrator of that account, you can just delete it, and it just went away and it, it never existed, right? But, yeah. you know, as they, as they talked about in the video, and you may have even alluded to, if you see nothing but positive reviews... Mm -hmm. it, is, is it really real? That authenticity you know, is, is not there. Is that off? You yeah. know, is is that there? And so what we try to do is we try to take those head on. So if someone mm -hmm. comes on and says, "Hey, I'm having an issue." You know, we try to engage that person right away and say, "You know, I'm so sorry that you're having an issue. You know, please send me your direct contact information so we can see if we can get something resolved for you." You know, so I think when people go through your social media platforms um, and see, okay, people understand that. You can have an issue with something. Mm -hmm. and I think it makes it more real, more authentic. More authentic. If they it. see that someone had an issue, the company engaged, and that issue got resolved. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that social media, mainly Twitter for whatever reason, but it just kind of is that way, you know, and the, it's really become the new customer service. That's how people can connect to a company quicker. You can get a company's attention faster on social media than if you call in. Yeah, that's powerful. Well, let's jump right into the last segment, and uh, then we'll come back and, and, and wrap this up. How do you be genuine online? How can you show that you're not, uh, you're just saying that just because we can? <laughs> You've seen canned answers. I mean, you can tell, oh gosh, that's a PR guy. You know, I mean, I'm in the business, I'm like, God, that's definitely written by a PR guy. But then sometimes you're just spoken to like you were being in an actual conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, you when you're too polished, sometimes it seems less authentic and genuine. Hmm. Um, but there are certain situations where you have to be as polished as possible because there could be legal concerns associated with it. So you have to evaluate the situation at hand, in my opinion, um, to determine how you speak to someone. Um, different parts of the country, um, different income levels, different, again, religious backgrounds. There's so much diversity people like to be spoken to in a certain way, so you have to identify the person on the other end before you relay mm -hmm. some sort of message to them. So I ideally, you know your audience, and then you can communicate to them in the way that they mm -hmm. want to be communicated. I think where you're talking to a mass group of people, you have to be a little more fluffy. 
-hmm. You have to be a little less detailed. Um, you have to give them enough to satiate them, but you don't want to give them too much and say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. But when you drill down and you're talking to a much smaller audience, you can be more focused, more genuine, more personal. Mm -hmm. And I think they appreciate that more. But you, again, you have to evaluate each situation uniquely before you can determine how that messaging plays out. The uh, recommendation I would offer to, um, to businesses for that uh, would be to think of their, their website as the foundation of their digital marketing. Uh, a lot of um, companies, their website is an afterthought, and then they wonder why they're not being so successful with their digital marketing. It's, it's your banner ad, it's, it's your ad, it's, it's where people can find you 24-7, so take it seriously. And um, you control the content on that. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, take a uh, evaluation of your, of your uh, target market and what social media platforms that they're on and how they like to be communicated with. It's such a broad question because there's, there's a lot of possible companies that, that could, uh, um, could hear this, but without speaking too exact, um, just website is the uh, foundation mm -hmm. and um, knowing your target market and where they are and how to, how to reach them. And I'll just add to that, unless you had a follow-up question. To Please that first. go for it. Not everyone can afford an agency. Not everyone can afford internal staff. But what you can afford is the time and forethought to put into your messaging before it goes out. Mm -hmm. I always suggest somebody have someone internally that can manage the, those messages. If they can afford to have a third party vendor work with that individual to bring a third party perspective to what they're doing, even better. Um, not everyone is there in their life cycle as a business but you really have to have more forethought about your overall messaging because at the end of the day, people are going to develop their own opinions about your brand and if you're not putting out things that help them shape that opinion, you're going to end up in a place you don't want to be. Mm -hmm. So taking, making sure you take the time to review all the, the content that goes out there, ideally have a dedicated person mm -hmm. for that. There, whatever industry you're in, you're an expert in that industry theoretically. Communications and marketing professionals are experts in their industry. I wouldn't ask my construction client to develop a crisis communication strategy, and they wouldn't ask me to build a bridge. <laughs> Even though I do have some of those skill sets, <laughs> I wouldn't feel comfortable because, you know, th there are huge lawsuits involved with yes. that. So, you know, think about it that way. We, we all are very good and talented in what we do, and we, we hire bankers, we hire accountants, we hire, you know, whoever makes our life better and makes sure our businesses succeed. Marketing, PR, digital, I mean, all those things in an integrated perspective. Video is a very important part of our world these days. All these things are done by professionals who know how to do them well and efficiently. And they're very, uh, they're priced well as well. People may see it as a huge expense, but whenever you can share return on that investment at the end of the day, give your agency, your communications, internal communications persons a chance to help you elevate your brand because that's what they're experts in. So this concept of the website, uh, having a website as a, as a foundation, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I completely agree. I mean, the website used to be an afterthought. It used mm -hmm. to be you created one because you had the storefront or, mm -hmm. you know, you just created one because you thought you had to. Well, today, it's the first thing that you have. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing that you have after you create your widget and that you decide you're going to take it to market. Because if you don't have a website, no one's going to find out about you. Mm -hmm. You know, the days of all the old advertising, print, and all, it's, all, it's all over. You know, so the website is your foundation. It's where customers find out about you the first time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's also the first opportunity that, you know, it's the first interaction that they've had with you and your company and your product. So it's got to where you got to put your best foot forward. But it's also the possibly the first interaction that you're that a customer could have with you from a customer service standpoint as well. Mm. So their their interpretation of you is immediately like how fast you respond and everything comes right from no question. I mean, especially in our industry, I mean, we we sell homes. We build homes for for families. And so you know, it's the largest single investment that someone's ever going to make. And if they have a question, you know, fast as the new slow, it's got, you've got to be on demand. And you've got to be instantaneous on your responses and not just the gimmicky autoresponders that you get back because everyone can see right through that. You tell. know exactly what you're getting, mm -hmm. that that didn't come from a real life person. And so, you know, the, it, what our take on it is, is if someone reaches out and has a question about one of our homes, then we get back with them within normal business hours. We want to have a five-minute or less response time. Wow. 
and that's fast. But we have somebody dedicated that's all their mm-hmm. whole job is to do that. But because just think about it from the consumer's eyes. If I have a question about this large investment, whether it be a home or a car or any other type of larger purchase other than a, you know, a pair of blue jeans or something like that, and I have a question about it, and it takes you three days to get back with me, mm-hmm. and I haven't paid you yet, how is the customer going to feel that after they, if they decide to pay you and give you money for your service or item, yeah. how's the service going to be after the fact? Because if it takes you that long to get back with me and I want to buy something, how are you going to treat me when I actually do write you a check? And so that's what I mean by customer service. Customer service is, today is all about speed. Speed shows that you care. Yeah, powerful. Well, thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And definitely check out Royal Hooks Homes. Get one of their homes. They'll definitely respond within five minutes. (laughs) Give them a call. That's right. (laughs) And I'm really uh, thankful for Chuck and David from SNA Communications that they could join us and they could share their, their thoughts. So we'll see you all next time. Thanks so much.